Hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 4 of the Drone to 1K Podcast. I'm your host, David Young, coming at you from my mobile office this morning, a.k.a. my car, still in North Carolina on a little trip with the family. And I know this podcast is coming out in... Uh, it's coming out on Thursday. Today's Wednesday, so I'm getting this done right beforehand. But I'm very excited about today's episode. I always say that. But today... We have Joey Howard on the podcast, who is an engineer. I've wanted to get a real engineer on the podcast for so long. So I'm super pumped that we have Joey coming. If you're interested in photogrammetry, if you don't know what that is, basically mapping, uh, creating models and terrain and elevation data, um, think Google Earth, but very specific and tons more (laughs) detailed data that you can use for companies. Uh, Joey does that. He uses LiDAR. He uses, like I said, photogrammetry, which is stitching a bunch of pictures uh, together to create um, accurate measurements and representations of what's on the ground. Very cool stuff. He talks about a lot of use cases and examples. So if you're ever wondering, what do people use drone mapping for? Or I've heard of LiDAR, but I don't really know what it is or the specific projects that people are doing or even bigger, why companies care? Like, why would someone hire you to do something like that? You know, that's a lot of questions people get, or they just maybe don't have as much context or understanding because, you know, things like drones for real estate is kind of uh, more in the public and kind of common knowledge, and you can get your head around that and understand that, oh, you need to sell a house, pictures from the air are cool, they'll hire you for that, you hear about that, uh, or marketing. But some of this stuff that's more business to business or government contracts, it's not as widely talked about. It's not as public. But to be honest, that's where probably the higher dollar amounts are um, if you know what you're doing. So uh, very valuable episode to listen to if that is your interest. Plus, Joey's just a super awesome guy. Very nice. Loves to like give information and talked about, hey, I just love giving back. And after the podcast, he even messaged me or was talking to me. He was like, hey, man, if you ever want to put on like a local thing for a school or whatever, I'm happy to like volunteer my time. So just a super great guy. And uh, I'm excited that he's going to talk to you today. So jumping into that episode in just a second. Um, if this is your first time listening to the podcast, Drone to 1K, we interview successful drone entrepreneurs or people who are using drones in their business, and they're making at least $1,000 or more uh, with their drone. So that means either they're side hustling it and they're making like just $1,000 getting started, or we have people like Joey, who are very successful, many entrepreneurs, up in the six figures, multiple six figures range. So we're gonna give you a broad spectrum of what is possible out there with your drone. So we're excited that you're here. If you wanna win some free swag, drone launch t-shirts, a free course, free coaching call, uh, things like that, you can click the link in the bottom of this video if you're on YouTube or click the link in your email to answer one question after you listen to today's podcast. It's just like a random factoid that'll enter you to win some stuff. Or if you want to guarantee, you can just go to um, Apple Podcasts, leave us a review, screenshot the review, send it to me, david at drillnotchacademy.com, and also send it to george, J O R G E, at drillnotchacademy.com. And we'll send you a shirt as a thank you for leaving, uh, taking the time to leave a review. Make sure you're honest in the review. I'm not trying to bribe you to only leave a good review. Just say what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it, whatever you want to say. Just want to say thank you for taking the time to do that. So other listeners know if this podcast sucks or is really good. Uh, and that is up to you. And we always want to make it as valuable as possible for you. So with that much further ado, here's Joey Howard. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Drone to 1K podcast. Uh, I'm here with Joey Howard of Cascade Stream Solutions. Thanks for uh, chatting with me, Joey. Hey, thanks for having me here. All right, so this episode I'm pumped for because uh, you're an engineer that uses drones, so I like getting a good variation of guests on here. We have a good mix of people who do real estate with drones or video production, some people that kind of dabble in mapping or they say, oh, yeah, I do mapping, and then you know, it's a little bit more of, oh, Somebody else does all the processing and the analysis and all that stuff, and they're kind of just doing the data collection, which is fine. But, you know, it's nice to get a, a broader perspective of different ways drones can be used. So I'm excited to get some of your insights uh, from an actual engineer and kind of on that data side of things. So I'm, I'm glad you're here with us, and I'm sure everybody listening will be pumped uh, for what you're going to bring today. So, Joe, I always like 
to open it up by asking, how did you first um, get into drones? I know you've been an engineer for a long time. So maybe first talk about how you got into engineering and then you can fast forward to when did you start dabbling in drones? So with respect to engineering, um, I've been practicing for about 30 years. I've uh, been on my own probably about eight years now. But uh, back in the day, um, we would use remote sensing data such as LIDAR and ortho uh, photogrammetric data to do floodplain mapping, to assess hazards and those kind of things. And my first experience with LIDAR was back in about 2006 when uh, Airborne One, which I don't know if they're still in business, but they were down in Southern California. They flew the Santa Margarita River over uh, a Marine base down there, Camp Pendleton. And so we were hired by the Navy to, uh, and they had a big flood, washed out you know, several millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of helicopters. And so we were supposed mm. to assess flood hazards and uh, so that we could design levels there. So that was my first experience. The problem that we had back then is that we didn't have a good way to process LIDAR data. So, uh, and the data sets were so huge compute, compared to our computing power that we just weren't really able to filter points. So that was something that was kind of interesting. Then moving on to uh, some of the FEMA mapping work, we used uh, orthophotography to develop brake lines and develop uh, high resolution imagery. And then we use the LIDAR data to uh, develop the surface and then augment those brake lines. Uh, had some experiences in the town of McLeod near Shasta, uh, Mount Shasta, where there was a uh, mirror that was loose on the LIDAR sensor. And we didn't realize that until we had done a lot of work. And, um, and so essentially we found that out by testing it with ground data. So this is all to say that, you know, I had this background in remote sensing data. So when I went out on my own, um, I started, I got a P2, a Phantom 2, and I started uh, looking at a one pre-project conditions, getting fo aerial photos for that. They weren't ortho rectified photos. And then I went on to like just film equipment operating and, and so that I could show clients and others how things got constructed. And then back before we had the FAA regulations, which I think are a good thing. So I'm not con complaining about that. <laughs> during a high, uh, I was flying up around a thousand feet during this flood and we were able to see these flood zones, and just how the water was interacting with the floodplain. So that's, and then I gradually moved on from uh, say that I got had a P3, that one before it had like a really good um, uh, obstacle sensing. I crashed that three times in the water and was able to re <laughs> resurrect that. Um, and then I had Mavic Pro, Mavic Pro 2. I used Mavic Pro with Photo Recap, which is an Autodesk product to develop ortho photos. Um, that was really susceptible to wind conditions and so on and so forth. So, um, and you know, I've gone through m many different drones, but now I primarily use it to uh, collect LIDAR data and collect okay. uh, high resolution ortho photos. Uh, and then also some oblique imagery uh, and some other things we can go into later called large scale particle imaging velsimetry, where basically it hovers over a water surface and then you can, the USGS and others have software to process that so that you can do particle tracking. So you can measure the flow or the velocity field on the surface. And then there's equations that give you average velocities, depth average velocities. So then you can calculate um, uh, flow because so, you know that area times velocity equals flow. And so, sure. and, I mean, and, I know you know that, but I'm sure not a lot of people listening are going to be as, you know, uh, all your, uh, you're assuming a lot of knowledge of me uh, in this call, but I'm just going to let, I'm going to roll with it. No, I apologize if I use jargon, please stop. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying, I'm just, no, the only, I will go back and I'll, I'll recap and I'll, I'll ask some of the pieces where I either, I'm, I don't know what it is, or I feel like other people, listeners might not know what it is, but okay. no, this is great so far. Keep going. I, I don't want to interrupt you. Oh, no, no, no. And, and that's so basically I've had that experience. And so I wouldn't say drone or the use of drones are the exclusive part of my business, but they're very an important part of the business. And, and you've probably heard like on a more somber note, uh, some of the fires we've had on the West Coast and mm. they've been 
dramatic. And locally, I live in Ashland, Oregon, and we had a fire that started three miles from a house. It burned Ooh. up uh, close to, I think it was over 3,000 structures and burned along the Whoa. Air Creek Parkway. And so I'm working with, um, with local entities to uh, collect both LIDAR and orthophotogrammetric data so that we can help rehabilitate this area. It was really devastating. And so yeah, a lot scary. of my work that I'm doing now are on these burn areas. And some of the burn mm-hmm. areas, um, they're so hazardous because you could have tree fall that mm-hmm. uh, they don't allow people to get in there until they can clean that up. And so if you're going to mm-hmm. survey that, a lot of that survey work needs to be done remotely. Oh, wow. I never would have thought of that, about the, have being, it being hazardous just to go there on the ground after that happens. They had That's a guy die on. over near Hayfork where a tree fell you know you'd think you'd hear a tree fall and you could get out of the way but apparently not or because not it was just weakened from the fire and, and all I, that yeah because basically yeah they're they're burned up depending on the intensity of the fire yeah. burn really hot they lose their stability you get wind or maybe another tree or branch falls against it and it goes down so um so drones can be very useful in doing remote sensing both for risk assessment as well as getting in there before other people are in there to make sure that people aren't being harmed. Yeah. That's really, that's really cool. Really interesting. I mean, not always the fire's not cool, but you can use drones for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, So let's, you know, I want to fill in some of the gaps for me because we have some listeners that are probably familiar with mapping, LIDAR, photogrammetry, things like that. But uh, I know we have a lot of people who are, they're just, they're just dipping their toe in the water. So they probably don't know what all these terms mean. So, uh, give a real quick explanation of um, what LIDAR is, what it does, and then maybe also when you say, you know, photo, you know, or orthomosaic imagery or, you know, whatever sure, sure. terms you like to throw around. Maybe just give a, if you were explaining it to your 10 year old nephew, what would you, what would you say? So uh, essentially, orthophotos are a series of photos that are stitched together. And they're rectified, meaning that the distances are, because if you have like a phantom whatever, and I'm, I, it doesn't matter what camera you have, but even your regular cameras, you're going to have some barrel distortion. And so what yep. the photos do is they have a certain amount of overlap, and then the software processes it and stitches it together. So like Google Earth, where you can measure the width of a street or something like that. And so you don't have that distortion within that photo. So, and photos get their light typically from the sun. So, you know, there's shadows and so on and so forth. LIDAR is, I'm going to botch this, but it's like light ranging and detection or something like that. And so basically yeah. it's a sensor that uh, sends pulses of light. They have returns and then it measures different intensities of those returns. And they can be filtered to identify whether it's ground, whether it's a power line, I mean, it's not going to say power line. It's just going to give. Sure, but you can interpolate it, yeah. And, and you can filter that. And so they use some of this data for, uh, you can do power line surveys. Uh, they have software. Uh, there's Green Valley Industries. I think that's what they're called, GVI. And I'm not promoting any of this stuff. I do use some of the products. No, sure. I'm just saying there's yeah. this software out there where they can use it for foresters, can use it for measuring the dimensions of trees, tree canopy size and whatnot. So when they're doing a forestry management plan, which I don't do, they can use this data to do that. Yeah. And, and so, then, okay, yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, I was, no uh, you can keep definitely keep going what you're saying, but I was going to say also maybe uh, explain when you would use orthophotos versus LIDAR and kind of uh, what's appropriate for which type of situations, what you're trying to do. Sure. So in general, um, it depends on the sensors that you have. Uh, what I'm flying today for most of my commercial work is a DJI M300 with a P1 camera. And uh, so basically at 120 meters, I'm getting a ground sampling distance of like 1.3 centimeters. So basically it, it picks up in like in areas, if I fly lower, it's basically the ground sampling distance is a factor of the height that you're flying at. Mm-hmm. So uh, like I had to fly under, I was near an airport and I had to fly at a certain elevation. I had to fly under uh, 200 feet. And so my ground sampling distance was really, really tight. And so <laughs> yeah. I pick up the rails of a shopping cart. 
Mm, and, yeah. And so the, the reason you want photo is if you want to identify things based on that. You can also develop surfaces off that, but it doesn't penetrate through vegetation. So basically you're going to hit a leaf or a tree, but you're not really going to see underneath that. Whereas what LIDAR does is the general rule of thumb is if you can see either 25% of the ground or if you're looking up, you could see 25% of the sky, you can generally get enough returns to get a surface. So then what you can do is you can get more of a 3D image in terms of you can get the ground underneath the tree, you can get the leaves. I could email you some examples to, and then you could show other people or I'm sure people could Google it or use whatever browser yeah. to find it. But so the primary difference is LIDAR is going to penetrate vegetation in general better than uh, ortho photography. And you're going to get a more reliable surface in vegetated areas. There is software. You can weed that stuff out and process it. Yeah. But yeah. In general, that's no. Nice. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a great explanation. I appreciate you breaking it down for maybe those of the, uh, the listeners who may not be as familiar with that. Cause we get a lot of people, oh. here, like I said, who are, Hey, they want to take real estate photos, but they're kind of interested in mapping or other stuff that drones can do, but they may be not as knowledgeable about, about everything. Or you're gonna you're gonna add something. Oh, the the other thing was that lidar produces its own light. So basically, mm -hmm. if you don't have to worry so much, like if you're collecting orthophotography, uh, you need to worry about uh, shadows and stuff like that. So like a cloudy day is a great day to fly for ortho photos. It might not give you the best looking photo, but it's going to dull those shadows. For Whereas the data, LIDAR, you, need, yeah. you could fly theoretically at night. And, you know, if you're flying a drone, you obviously need to have a variance for that. Right, right. No, that's awesome. Great explanations. I think it's super helpful. Um, so let's dive into, you know, going back into when you were, so you were using a Phantom 2, which you're like a you're like OG drone user then if you started using them back then with and your, uh, with your engineering them. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it means you're old. No, you're not old. Um, so when as you were as you were implementing them in jobs, you said you first started off kind of using them to like survey the sites. Um, maybe walk through. I think people would be normally. I just go through and just get people's stories, and sometimes it's like, hey, how did you get these clients and this and that? But I feel like um, for our conversation, I think it would be helpful for people to hear all a lot of different ways that you're using drones and cool projects and things you've worked on. Um, so they can get kind of get a taste of all the different cool things that drones can do in engineering or surveying and, and using LIDAR, all that great stuff. So um, maybe can you think of a one of your favorite examples maybe of when you were using the drone for um, getting ortho photos and maybe walk us through that project and how you got the data and what you were looking for, like what problems were you helping solve with that, with those projects? Sure. So um, I, I think... The highest uh, pucker factor is when you're in hilly terrain with mm -hmm. large trees because um, I use uh, what's termed terrain following. So basically, mm -hmm. it has the flight planning software. First, let me say that in many cases when I'm collecting LIDAR, well, actually, when I'm collecting LIDAR, I am not controlling the drone except for mm -hmm. taking off and landing. I'm doing yep. some calibration patterns and then I'm doing some calibration patterns at the end and I'm trying to bring it down smoothly because there's an inertial measurement unit in there that you try to keep that thing steady because if you do mm -hmm. certain things, it's going to mess up your data. So, um, so I pre-plan those flights and then I upload it to the drone and then I just make sure that I'm not going to crash into anything. Um, yeah. So what software are you using when you do that? So there's several different types of software. You can use DJI pilot, but mm -hmm. you have to, they call them DSM or digital surface models. And you have to bring those mm -hmm. in. I, the, I typically just use UGCS, which is, mm -hmm. uh, oh gosh, user, uh, ground control, software or something like that. Good. There's user and their ground control and their software in there. And so I use that and it's a pretty good software. It's not cheap. You know, it's, I think you're paying, mm -hmm. you know, 15 or 1800 bucks a year for it. 
but it's a really good software. It does a great job because when you're collecting this data, and I know, no, I'm getting off the topic of what you're saying. But no, it's good. Yeah. It's you'd have to be some sort of idiot savant. Nothing against idiot savants, but you'd have to be one to be able to collect the data in a way. It's just not humanly possible because you might be flying an area that's I don't know twenty hectares. You could be getting a thousand photos with an overlap of 75%, that's what I typically fly, at a certain elevation over the ground, it's just not humanly possible to go and take those photos. So you are programming that in the software. Then if you add in that you have some hill slopes and you have trees and you have you know, maybe a cell tower, then you got to put a little more thought into that. And mm-hmm. And that's where I think, for me, the major concern comes in. Most of my areas I fly are fairly remote, so I don't have to worry about that stuff. Um, I mean, the hill slopes and the trees I do. So, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. You say, I mean, yeah, you keep telling your story. You know, so you were were talking about, um, you know, I was asking you, what are some good examples of projects that come to mind that you've done? Uh, and kind of what problems that we, were you solving with those? You know? So in Doyle, California, there was a big burn out there. And so it's for the county of Lassen. And um, the hill slopes are of a fairly fine material. They had a large uh, rain uh, vent come through. And so basically these hill slopes eroded dramatically. And so one thing that was very interesting is you could see the sequencing of the sediment and the deposition coming through. So they had these channels that were there, and then you had these uh, debris flows from these fans coming in, cutting off the channel, and then you had the, the stream adjusting. Now, I'm not capturing the sequence of events, but what I can do is I can look at this I can collect the data. I can get that bare earth data. So I'm stripping the vegetation off of it. Not that there is much because it's been burned, but I can do that. And then I can start to interpret how that's changed. If you have other photo, like historic photo data, then you could do a comparison and see. Um, And then it was also interesting because when you got down in the canyon region, you have these hyper concentrated flows or flows that have a lot of sediment in it. And basically, you saw incision down there where you saw deposition upstream. And so you could see the geomorph- What's the difference between incision and deposition? What are those? So what do you mean when you say that? Incision is a process of downstream channel cutting where the stream kind of, like, say, if you have a stream like this, it lowers and then the stream just kind of lowers and it cuts back up. So, okay. um, so basically, it forms a fairly narrow channel. When it does that, it confines the flow, causing very high shear stresses within that narrow channel. Whereas if you had a channel like this, the flow has going to have less energy to pick up particles. Whereas when it goes oh, like I this, it's going to have gotcha. much higher. deeper. And so, gotcha. okay, yeah. So, uh, and I can make a bird and I can... Like, <laughs> you know, but anyway, but sorry. For those hand. of you only listening to the audio version, he's, he's <laughs> exactly he's, he's really confused. But basically, he said, if it's if it's flatter, it's not going to pick up as much particles. Whereas if you have like a deeper channel, yeah, it's, exactly. it's going to have a lot more force to pick things up. Yes. So um, sorry, sorry. Yes, no, but not to get into too much jargon or whatever. But the main thing is, it allows one to do interpretation of the surface and to see those changes in the surface. And so I found that very interesting. Uh, the other thing is they plan on doing restoration for this site. So basically it was a mitigation site. It was a wetland mitigation site. So, so now the thing is how do we control sediment into that area? So we have this data where we can look at it and we can look at where the sediment sources are and what we might want to do to control those sediment sources. The other thing is we can come back in, t- in maybe, I don't know, next year we could survey the same area and then we could subtract the two surfaces and we can find out where the sediment was eroded from and where it was deposited to. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. And the people that are hiring you to do this, I mean, obviously this sounded like a, whatever municipality it was, they yes. hi- hired you to do this project. And then for them, I'm, I'm just kind of even going one step further. What's their motivation for hiring you? Like what I want people to understand, like, 
why do people care to bring in an engineer to look at all this stuff? You know? So, and I think it's the most, the majority of the United States where I could be wrong here, but if you want to sell a uh, mapping at data, you have to either have a professional land surveying license or a professional engineering license. There are some photogrammetric things, and I don't know much about what that allows you to do, but you have to have those licenses if you're going to sell it as, as a certain type of project. So they have to come to somebody like me or a licensed land surveyor or photogrammetrist. And, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say I understand that, but like, what are they? What are they looking? What's their motivation? Like, oh man, we need to get an engineer in here so we can do X, Y, Z. Right? What, what's their motivation? This site was a mitigation site, saying so we're going to disturb one area, and because we're causing this disturbance, we have to create some sort of mitigation or habitat to offset that okay. loss. So. For example, say they were going to build a road or over a bridge, mm -hmm. something like that. Then mm -hmm. the resource agencies might say, well, you're taking away this habitat. You need to do something beneficial. And so this gotcha. was their mitigation, mitigation site that got burned. And then it's got all these. And now they're dealing with sediment coming in, which is uh, not conducive to having a, a really good mitigation site. Oh, and I so see. They so it was already, us. gotcha. It was already a mitigation site that kind of got messed up because of the fires. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, so they need this to stay as like a, I mean, in, I'm in Florida and we have a bunch of wetlands here. I'm not sure if that's similar where you are, um, but I know here it's, if you, right, if you, if you're going to develop some wetlands and destroy them somewhere, you have to like create new ones somewhere else to kind of like offset it. Is that kind of the same theory? And in that case, they may hire somebody there to fly an area. With that flight, what they could do is they could assess the vegetation. You wouldn't need an engineer to collect that data for that. They could use mm -hmm. that data, the land surface, to as for planning purposes, to do grading for lots or to do wetlands yep. or whatever. And, um, and so that would be why somebody would hire somebody to gotcha. do some remote sensing drone services. And you could gotcha. do a, a combination of air photos uh, and LIDAR or just, you know, one of those. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's super helpful because it's just like, you know, these aren't as mainstream of problems that everyday people would see, right? Like you can easily comprehend like, oh, real estate agent needs photos for a house because everybody sees houses for sale. And like people know that that exists, right? It, it's easy. It's very visible or like, marketing video production it's it's easy for people to comprehend but some of this stuff where it's you know govern governments or municipalities asking for you know data that's maybe a little more technical and specific a lot of people would just never know that that stuff existed or that it happens or anything like that so i think well, it's helpful let, kind of yeah let me give you a, a more concrete or another concrete example yeah that'd be great yeah. if we have uh somebody who wants to develop near a stream or do something. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I have a project in Oregon where we removed a dam. So FEMA, okay. Federal Emergency Management Agency, is requiring us to do a letter of map revision saying that the floodplain has changed by X amount because of these activities. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I did was I flew it and I had a pre-project condition and I had a project condition. And that data, that topographic data that I got from that remote sensing I used to develop a hydraulic model, a numerical model that models water surface elevations. And I, okay. and so I used the remote sense data the, to, to develop that. And uh, so that would be a common ap application. Uh, drones are really good at the small scale. If you were going to say map a very large area and by large area, it would be, you know, square miles or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The typical quadcopter is probably not going to be the right tool. You're going to want something different. Right. In those, in those instances, are you finding companies that have like airplanes or helicopters? Who's, what kind of aircraft yeah, is typically so, doing that kind of work or so satellites? A company, in, I think they're across the United States, but Earth Data, I believe that's what they're called. And they have an office out of Eugene. So I'm working somewhat on the climate dam removal project. 
and I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's a big project on the West Coast where they're going to remove three of the largest dams in the world. And, oh, wow. um, and so they flew, I don't know how long it is, but oh, like 180 miles of the Klamath River. And they flew okay. it with green LIDAR, and, which allows you to penetrate a certain depth into the water. And that depth is okay. determined by the opacity or the turbidity of that water. And so something like that, one couldn't do. Or, right. Yeah. And so take you forever with a drone. Yeah. Yeah. Take you forever. And so they did that. And I don't know what that project costs, but there are probably fees for that were in the order of millions of dollars. And like yeah. back in the day, I did some mapping projects for the San Francisco Bay and we hired, I, I don't think they're even in business any longer. Maybe they are Merrick. And they mapped the San Pablo and Sassoon Bays with LIDAR and orthophotography. And obviously they used that, but that contract was in the order of millions of dollars. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'm guessing, well, you know, when someone's using an actual aircraft and huge sensors like that to map, obviously those are going to be more expensive, which is probably why drones have become much more popular, right? For the smaller scale stuff because it's so much cheaper and easier and faster, right? Absolutely. And see that you just hit on the key of one of the reasons why I got into it is because this data, I can go out and collect data that would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars or whatever, and I can collect them for a fairly small amount of money. Um, yeah. you know, I don't know, you know if you want to get into this, but you know, in terms of costs, sure. um, you, you know, the cost, so an M300 is somewhere around 13,000 or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. the batteries alone, it takes two batteries. They're $700 a piece. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, how much I, flight time will that give you on that? Uh, so it depends on the payload with the P1, which is a, a camera. It's a full frame camera that will give mm-hmm. me about a little over like 35 minutes. I mean, there's always that one thing about like, you don't want to come down with 5% percent of battery, right, right? right you know yeah. so there's that aspect yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. and then with the lidar sensors i would say i fly probably no longer than 26 minutes will be what the flight plan says but mm-hmm. i'm doing a pattern to calibration pattern at the beginning and end so it might be 30 minutes and mm-hmm. okay. um and so but then you know you figure like a p1 camera i don't know what the going rate is now but it's like sixty five hundred dollars so pretty soon, like I just got into LIDAR and I would say I probably spent around 70000 Um On the LIDAR? Well, but see, the LIDAR unit's not that much. I mean, it's maybe 19000 or so, but with okay. the training. But then you got to get storage systems. You got to get a compu- mm-hmm. upgrade computers. Now you're talking terabytes of data. So then you oh, have- just so much more data, so much more processing. Oh yeah, like I just kind of like skim through here and and the like the stuff. There's flight planning software. There's processing mm-hmm. software. There's all unique to lidar. You're saying? Yeah, I mean, but the seventy thousand allowed me to to do that capability, yeah. and that probably yeah. included the P one. Yeah, and- I just looked up P ones like a little over six grand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're great cameras. They're, I'm sure yeah. there's other competitors have great cameras too, but that's a great camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. So you're you're 70 grand. That's all in with your M300, your P1, your LiDAR sensor, software, some training, all that stuff. It, and I upgraded two computers. So that includes maybe oh, 14,000 yeah. in computers. 14,000 uh, in computers? Well, I mean, Man, that's... you're like a workstation. So yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying that's those are must be some sweet computers. <laughs> uh, they're, I mean, they're pretty fast computers, and <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, but you could spend, like you said, you have a tons of storage and stuff too, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I have like 48 terabytes. Oh my but, goodness! Wow. But the problem is that you have backups, so it's not like you have mm-hmm. fully that amount of data. Um, sure. There's just a lot uh, of software and stuff that goes along with it and mm-hmm. uh, I'd be more than happy to list out, you know, some of the software I use and what I use it for or processes, if you think that's helpful. Um, but I think somebody can get into it reasonably inexpensively. Like a Phantom four is a great yeah. drone. I mean, I think they're going to mm-hmm. replace it pretty soon. 
I had a Phantom 4 RTK. They're great mm -hmm. drones. Uh, the, the only issue is the camera is only 20 megapixel with, I believe, a one-inch sensor. And yeah. so it, it doesn't give you the resolution. It, well, not at the same of the as the P1, but for if it, you're yeah. if you're closer to the ground, it probably does okay, right? Oh, it does a great job. The other thing yeah. is with a bigger platform like the M300, um, mm -hmm. it's more stable in the wind, so mm, yeah, so you can fly it in different conditions and get better uh, accuracy. Um, yeah, and so yeah, but you can do a lot with a P4, and yeah. you don't even need the P4 RTK. Yeah, well, let's talk about the RTK for a second, if you don't mind. Um, you know, what, well, first off, can you explain RTK, PPK, some of that stuff to uh, our users, to your 10 year old nephew again? <laughs> so essentially, what RTK does is real time kinematic, uh, that's what it stands for, adjustment. So basically, you have a base station which is collecting satellite data. And then you have a rover that is getting corrected information from the base station. A true surveyor would just like probably is just shutting off the podcast at this point. But but no, that's listen, essentially that, what there might be. There might be one or two. It might be a few surveyors, but there's a whole lot more people who are just here to you know general population gathering information. So talk to them. So so that's essentially what RTK is. PPK is post processing that kinematic data. So basically what that means is that the base station got a file and then like for a LIDAR unit, you're not doing real time, you're post-processing that. And so what you will do is you'll have a file in whatever craft that is associated to time with the collection of that data. It could be LIDAR data or it could be uh, ortho photos or I guess any sort of data. And then it, and then it, on the same satellite time so then you go back and at this is why you want big computers or powerful computers is then now it's processing all that data and and then it's tying that so it's spatially correct if that mm, makes sense okay. and yeah. so like you look at a lidar sensor and depending on your sensor you could get 200 points per meter so it's correcting all those points so that they're within mm -hmm. a few centimeters. Of gotcha. And data. when you say points, you mean like data points from whatever it Yeah, captured. data points. It's, yeah. So in an image, like an ortho photo, that would be like uh, pixels of the image of the ground. Oh, like yeah. Well, it, for an ortho photo, if you have pixels, you could have, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a thing. It's like with the P1 camera, that's a downside of having a camera like that versus uh, the Phantom 4 camera is the uh, P1 camera, like in a flight, I could pick up, I don't know, 10 gigabytes of data. Mm -hmm. And then when you post-process that, then you come down to an mm -hmm. eight gigabyte thing. And now you need something to make it usable. So I don't know, uh, there's this company that bought Mr. Sid, which is a photo compression software. It's called GeoExpress. Mm -hmm. Then, so I purchased a GeoExpress license so I can compress this data so that it can be usable in, say, your ArcMap, your Esri GIS systems, or Autodesk systems, because otherwise the data sets are just, just so can't handle it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so, yeah, sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there. No, 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 this is great. I'm asking you questions. Um, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, man, I feel like we could probably just talk about this stuff for hours more. <laughs> We're at 35 minutes, but I want to ask you, if you have one more project you can think of, maybe where you specifically used um, LIDAR and maybe you walk us through that project. I just really enjoy hearing about the projects, what you did, why you were doing it, uh, those, th that type of scenario. So in one project, um, so this project is on the Scott River in Siskiyou County, California. And that was an area that had been dredged mined. So basically for about four lineal miles of the Scott River, they went from edge to edge. And in this location, the drainage area is probably around 400 to 600 square miles. So it's a big area that drains. Yeah. It's a decent sized river. And the Scott River watershed is probably, you probably haven't heard of coho salmon, but coho salmon is, a, is an endangered species. 
and or maybe it's just list or it's threatened, but it's it's basically a species of interest. And so a lot of money, that's what, one of the reasons why the climate dams are coming out. So in this area, it's just been denuded because of this uh, gold mining activities. They just went up and they basically turned the river upside down. So what we did was we put in some habitat structures, some large wood structures there to create habitat. There happened to be a large fire upstream. And so what we've been using the LIDAR data for is to track the progress of basically how we've seen uh, the morphology or the ground around these structures change, plus how we've seen the fine sediment deposit. And so we take photos over time. The other thing I guess would be maybe more interesting is, um, so on Mount Shasta, there is a, uh, well, one particular debris flow that is threatening the town of McLeod and the town of, uh, uh, the water supply for the town of McLeod. So one thing okay. that we're doing, and so a debris flow, uh, it's kind of instigated by glacier melt. And so as okay. these glaciers on uh, Mount Shasta melt, they cause these debris flows, and it's just mud that flows uncontrollably across the surface. Mm. And so what okay. we're doing is we're using LIDAR to fly and sense where the debris flow is, and we're coming back annually to see how the de- debris flow has moved as well as what the mitigation measures have done. So like basically gotcha. what they're trying to do is dig a channel downstream that word incised to create an incised yeah. channel. So the debris flow will preferably or fall, flow into that. And they and control it away from whatever the water supply is. It, it's the, from the water supply and the town. Gotcha. So, okay. So yeah, that I think is a pretty interesting example, or at least for me. Uh, other yeah, than, no, I think that's, one thing that I think will be really interesting, which I haven't figured out how to do yet, but there are some journal articles on this, is they're using these um, radiometric thermal sensors. So basically you see the advertisements for heat sensors and they use them for mm-hmm. like solar panels and stuff like that. Yep, yep. Um, FLUR is a big one that use, that creates these yep. sensors. So one of the things that they've done in Australia and some places in the United States, but it's not commonly practiced, is to fly these areas so that you can get temperature maps of streams and riparian areas. So basically you can see how the microclimates due to the vegetation, they also are able to sense surface temperatures of the water. So you can see Mm -hmm. where there's cold seeps that might be important for, in our case, coho salmon. Um, where mm. that cold is because water temperatures can become lethal when you get above, uh, I think it's like 20 some degrees C, 25 degrees C becomes uh, okay. lethal. Them. lethal but at any rate, you can see this. And, and so it's, it's a pretty cool thing. And that's something that I'd like to figure out how to do, but it becomes very complex in terms of uh, the thermography, which I don't truly understand all the complexities of it, but you're sensing through the atmosphere and mm-hmm. they're through that layer of air and then down there. So there's some calibration activities. But suffice it to say is I think in the near future, there will be looking at using that in post burn areas and the importance mm-hmm. of riparian areas in these things and how restoration activities help to change this. And remote sensing, I think, could be a, a very important thing. Yeah, no. That's really interesting. When you say riparian areas, what does that mean? So that would be uh, trees, and the botanists are going to be plugging ears now, but it's basically (laughs) trees that grow around streams and so that are getting that kind of flow or that subsurface flow and are kind of being fed by that. By the water, yeah. Like pine trees in general, I'm sure in Florida it's different, but are more of an upland plant. And so Mm -hmm. that would be like an upland, but then a cottonwood tree on the West Coast or alder, that would be riparian tree. And they offer a bunch of things such as shading. So they keep stream temperatures down. They provide nesting habitat and so on. And and when they fall, they provide uh, when they, you know, uh, micro and macro invertebrates and other bugs and stuff can eat them and, and and, you know, 
goes into that whole circle of life thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, man, I, again, I feel like we keep talking about this. I love hearing these examples and stuff, and I think it's helpful again for people listening to understand maybe a world that they're not exposed to that often is, hey, you know, like here's all the different cool stuff that you can use drones for. Here's how it can help people. Here, you know, like it's keeping people's waters supply clean. It's helping make sure places are safe before people start going in there in burned areas. It's like a lot of really interesting applications that you're doing that, yeah, people probably just never hear about. So um, and, and, and really glad you come on. I know we're running short on time, but real quickly, one of the things go that I've- Yeah, go, go ahead, please. Is that- I think it's important to figure out why you're interested in drones and no judgment. Some people just may really just enjoy flying the drones. Some may enjoy other things or some may evolve to enjoy other aspects of it. But to me, and I think especially for the younger generations out there, if you get some technical background where you could use, say, you become a forester, you become an engineer, a land surveyor, or environmental scientists where you can use this data, then I think the world is really going to open up to you. The other thing that yeah. I think is important is that it's good to have a basic understanding of geodetic systems, meaning kind of how we uh, assign coordinates to the Earth's surface and how we define that surface. And, and so having some basic understanding of that and vertical datums I think your training, which I very much enjoyed and benefit, the Part 107 training that I took from you guys, that was instrumental in making me legal and being able to allow me to do this oh, awesome. at a professional level. So I appreciate. I didn't that. Even realize that you had taken our. I didn't realize you had taken our course up until now. So no, I did. I did, and and I appreciate that. And I think you guys offer an excellent course, and so that kind of training is critical. There's also other training that you may or may not offer about how these things work and how to operate this equipment. But in general, I, I really would say if, if somebody's interested in this, uh, maybe if you're my age, it's hard to get into the, some of the more technical stuff without having a certain background. But if you have young kids or something like that, that mm -hmm. are interested, I think there's great opportunities because this is just going to become more and more prevalent. And introducing yeah. them into these possibilities of what they could do, I think will help people appreciate science and the opportunities out there. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. And I, I keep seeing things pop up too in kind of the same space where I'm not sure if you've seen, uh, it was just one startup basically where they have a, uh, a drone that goes around and shoots different like tree seeds into the ground for like reforestation areas. And, stuff. and again, I'm probably botching a lot of this, but uh, I just thought I was like, oh, that's really cool as they can plant like, 70 times more trees than uh, you know humans could if they were walking around it just kind of walks and just do 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 like shoots them into the ground oh, that's, that's amazing. like pre-drilled holes or something i just thought it was pretty sweet um, no that's great yeah, like I said, like, there's just, people are just thinking of more and more ways where drones can do stuff more safely more efficiently in all these types of areas so i think you're you're spot on um well and i was going to ask you for normally I, when we end it i'm like all right well what's one piece of advice you have for people but i feel like you just laid out a pretty good one right there uh, with your uh, with your advice there. Um, is there anything else you want to add, I guess, before we wrap up and then also kind of get some, uh, have you share with us where if, if people want to find out more about you, where they can where they can go to find out more about your business or hear about you? Sure. You know, in turn, um, I guess I'd be more than happy if there's people that want to reach out to me and, you know, I uh, give you a, an email address. Uh, it's too long to just say and expect, but um like I have plenty of work, so I'm not looking for work. I guess my main thing is helping people understand what, yeah, where they may fit in if they find this to be a technology that they're interested in doing, or yeah. I think especially with younger people and, yeah. and how we can help people do things. I think the impact on climate, uh, one, we can help measure the impact on climate and of how our climate's changing. The other thing is that when you fly a drone, your resource consumption is much less than when you're flying a plane. So when mm -hmm. we're mapping these areas, you don't have those costs. If you fly a helicopter, I mean, it's enormous, that carbon footprint, mm -hmm. whereas with a drone, sure, there is a significant carbon footprint with all the materials that went in there with me driving there and so on and so forth, but it's far less than with aircraft. So oh, yeah. well, other types yeah. of aircraft. Sure. And, um, yeah. And, and then I guess the other thing is I can't emphasize it enough for people to be one to get legal. 
so that they're flying within the regulations. And I do see things in comments where people are like saying, oh, you know, we hate the regulations and they're bad for this or bad for that. I do think they serve an important part because especially in areas where we have fire uh, aircraft flying around for fires, it keeps those people safe. Um, And it's also, yeah, I've been in canyons where I've been legal flying at legal limits and stuff like that. And then boom, a helicopter comes through and it's just like, Hmm. Oh my gosh, you know, that's terrifying. It's only happened twice, but it, yeah. it's one of those things where it, it just, you know, being safe is another thing. So with that, I guess that's yeah. a little according to Joey. <laughs> it's not many <laughs> no, people would great. want to subscribe to, but oh well. No, 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 this is great. This is great. Um, and I'll get your email from you or some contact information. Sure. We can put it in the uh, the show notes if people are um, want to check it out. Do you have a website for your business at all? I or do. Like, are you on LinkedIn or anything like that? And I apologize that I haven't updated it since I first started, but I do have a YouTube thing where I've shown some videos. They're not narrated. Oh, cool. And they're basically using different, both ground and air-based uh, photography. And what I used that for was during COVID, well, I could sh- send these things to people from NOAA or U.S. Fish and Wildlife or other entities that couldn't travel. And mm-hmm. I could give them status updates on the project. And so they could cool. look at That's this. good. Uh, and again, I'm yeah. not a video editor, so uh, I just kind of splice together some of these things. And yeah. I try to narrate them because I could barely stand my own voice. So I'm sure other people don't want to listen to it. <laughs> so the, the main thing was I just wanted to. And that's another thing I think is very useful. Is not that you're going to have a really popular YouTube channel, but you could show po- progress on different things. And I think... Yeah. Uh, drone video is great for that. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, um, uh, it's cascade stream solutions.com. Okay, cool. Well, we'll get that. We'll get that linked up, um, in case other people want to want to check it out and, um, get some info from you. I was going to say, be careful what you wish for. Cause I feel like after this episode, a lot of people are going to want to hit you up and, and ask you and ask you questions. Cause people are really interested in this kind of stuff. And, um, so, um, but yeah, I know people are always really appreciative of any, any advice they get, um, from people. So I appreciate you. Uh, being willing to talk to us and, and be willing to help and share. Um, so, yeah. So thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I'll have to maybe have you on again sometime and um, tell well, us more you. about projects. Cause again, you know, I know we're limited by time, but I feel like with as long as you've been in engineering and flying drones, we could probably <laughs> talk, talk a lot more. So um, it's great, great chatting with you, Joey. Thank you. Take care. All right. Sweet interview with Joey. Loves talking about that. Love getting all the detailed examples of why people are using mapping, modeling, how he applies engineering to drones and drones to engineering. Um, Very insightful and really enjoyed it. Uh, Hope you got a lot out of it too. One last reminder before we go, in the last episode's podcast uh, on the before and after, I talked about a new community that we launched called Drone Launch Connect. If you go to dronelaunchconnect.com, you can find more about it there. But it's a community for drone entrepreneurs and people using drones in their business to learn, to grow together, Um, it's more than just like a Facebook group, right? Yeah, we have a forum where you can talk about different things, but as a member, you get discounts to drone equipment and accessories. We bring in experts like, um, you know, people like Joey, we can get him on there. Uh, people in industries like thermal, uh, legal accounting, uh, insurance, uh, mapping, engineering, video production, people who have worked with huge brands and huge companies that are making six and seven figures to bring their knowledge to you. You can like ask them questions one-on-one. We have pitch practice to help you pitch and build your business. We have stuff for total drone newbies, different sessions. We have happy hours where you can just hang out. So it's a great place to get to know people, um, save some money, uh, and just be a part of an encouraging drone community. And you can start for just $1, $1 for the first month just to test it out. Um, We're going to close the community at the end of August, I believe. Um, and build it just internally with those members. So if that's something you're interested in, check that out or email me at david at dronelaunchacademy.com. If you've got more questions, you can email me at david at dronelaunchacademy.com. We can get you to the right spot. All right, thanks for listening to the podcast. I'll see you next week with a new episode. Take care.